I don't know about you, but I want to say two things about myself. One, I like gravity, and I think electricity is fundamentally a little bit more tricky because we can't manipulate it in the same way. And secondly, long algebraic derivations are very tricky for me. So if you're at all like me, I hope that this particular video will help you. I want to discuss uniform fields. A lot of the results that we'll get <clears throat> will be applicable only to uniform fields, but the process will work for any type of field. But we can go ahead and preface this with saying these will be uniform fields. And I also want, um, what do I want to do? I want to discuss the interaction of force and energy and potential and this is the one that I think is very tricky right now. And then also field. And this is a little bit less tricky field. But, but the idea of a potential, it fits in in a really natural way to connect these other three things that I think you understand a little bit better. So I'm going to explain first how these four things interact for gravitational force. And then we'll do the exact analogy and discuss how they interact for electrical force. Here we go. We'll start with sketching out a uniform field for, um, oh gosh, I'm split on whether I should split the screen. I think I can try to fit it in here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you about a uniform gravitational field, and then I'm going to tell you about a uniform electrical field. So my first plan is to get a uniform gravitational field, and I'm going to draw you um, some dirt, and this is our planet. And then uh, you've got, what do you want, a basketball hoop? Yeah, you do. Basketball hoop out here. Let's say it's like that a little bit. And there it is. Now you can play basketball in a uniform gravitational field. And the, uh, the thing about the uniform gravitational field is, oh, which way does it point? Do you know which way this field is pointing right here? I would say that this field is pointing uniformly that way. And this is an assumption. It assumes that the Earth is flat, but you know that works, right? We just don't need to talk about Columbus and all of that nonsense. <clears throat> and a uniform electrical field would be made in a very similar way. <laughs> just kidding. I'm going to uh, sketch out something that makes a uniform electric field. And here's my plan. I want a sheet of metal um, like a capacitor, but in this case, I'm going to actually make it a chunk of metal right here. Oh, I am going to run out of space. Ah, and then I'm going to put a similar one over here, just facing the other direction, and see what we can do with this. So in between these two, we're going to have a uniform electric field if we do a certain thing. I want to put positive charges here, and I want to put negative charges here. And we'll have an electric field that points which way? Well, you tell me, right? I think it points over that direction uniformly inside of it. So uniform electric fields require some particular effort to make, and uniform gravitational fields are a part of your everyday interaction. So that's the first reason, I think, the first justification for these being a little bit simpler to understand and this being a little bit more esoteric. So we've got an electric field right here, and we've got a gravitational field right there. I'm using a lowercase g for a particular reason. So I promised that we'd start with force. And uh, let's go with, yeah, pink. Force in a gravitational field is m times g. And force in an electric field is Q times E. So this is how much mass you've got, and this is how big the field is. This is how much charge you've got, and that's how big the field is. In order to go from force to energy, we're thinking about force, and we're trying to get work out of that. So we'll use, uh, we'll use green to show the process here. To go from force to energy, I need to integrate over distance. I think I can make it fit. I think I can make it fit. I think it's going to work. Energy is next. 
And if I integrate over distance, it doesn't matter where I go side to side. So we, instead of writing m times g times d, we write m or m times g times delta s or something, m times g times x, we don't do any of that nonsense. We know that it only depends how much we go in the direction opposite to the field, so it's m times g times h. And uh, we'll get a very similar result by integrating over distance. I'll give you the same arrow here because it's the same process. And then we're looking to say that energy for an electric field situation, where it's a uniform electric field, that's very important, is going to be q times e times, ooh, distance distance moved. And whether we're talking about a positive charge or a negative charge, I suppose I mean distance moved against the field if I'm talking about a positive charge. So we could define that right here. D equals distance. And this is not a standard definition, but I'm just trying to keep these exactly parallel to each other. Distance moved against the field is actually the opposite of the standard definition. Usually you'd put a minus sign out here and say d is the distance moved with the field. But I'm gonna say that d is the distance moved against field. And in this case, h is the distance moved against our field as well. So that gives us some nice symmetry. And then we need to know how to get from energy to this idea of potential. Here we go. And I want to divide by, and here it depends whether we're talking about gravitational or electric. Notice that in this one we've got a mass and in this one we've got a charge. These mass and charge quantities are what governs how a particle feels the force. Something with more mass feels more gravitational force. Something with more charge feels more electric force. And you see that right here. That's what governs how much force is being felt. So we're gonna divide by charge or mass, depending on the circumstance of the problem. Close the bracket. <clears throat> and we'll get the same process here. And in this case, I'm going to be saying, where am I going, pink? Uh, this is potential. And the potential, if I divide by the charge, is then just ed. Now, there's a minus sign in front of it if we're using the standard definition of D, and that will be for all our purposes, we will have a minus sign in front of it. But in this case, I have a positive sign because I'm saying distance moved against the field. So if you move against the field, then your potential increases. And if you move with the field, then your potential decreases. All right, if you've got that sense, then that's very good. This potential over here, will be, uh, I'm dividing by m, so this is a thing called g times h. That's a little bit funky. But I guess the potential represents, it's energy divided by how much oomph you've got. So if you put a certain mass at a certain potential, then you'd know how much energy you have. Let's look at it in the sense of gravitational. If I put, um, if I put a basketball up here, and I know the mass of the basketball, I can find out exactly how much energy I've got if I know G times H, I'll just multiply it by M. Similarly, if I take a charge and I put it at a certain potential, then I will know how much energy that charge has. Or maybe even more importantly, you know what's important is not the absolute value of H because you could put your H as zero anywhere. Similarly, you could put D equals zero equals anywhere and you have an arbitrarily defined potential, but it's differences in H and differences in D that make the, well, that have any real meaning. So it's really about, not about the absolute position of H or D because that's an arbitrary decision, but it's about how H and D change because it's not about absolute potential energy, it's about the change in potential energy. That's what gives you kinetic energy. It gives you usable energy, that change, that loss in energy. Okay, so then we're gonna go from potential and we're gonna go back home to a little bit more reasonable topic and that is field. And maybe you've never thought about this before. I know that some of my students haven't thought about that yet when I get to them. But gravitational field is, in fact, simply baby G. Maybe you grew up calling it the acceleration of gravity or free fall acceleration or something sissy like that. This is the strength of the gravitational field. And how did we get there? Well, we divided by, oh no, it wasn't just division. We actually differentiated with respect to distance. And simply because it was linear in distance, we just got rid of the distance. So it looks like division, but we're differentiating
with respect to, dang it, calculus, you have such wordy problems. Respect to distance. And there's not going to be any surprise when we do it over here. If I differentiate that with respect to distance moved, then I'm going to find the field to be E. What good news. So this is fantastically simple. The calculus is absolutely trivial. You integrate over distance when there is no distance, you've got a distance. You differentiate with respect to distance when distance is linear, your distance is gone. That's simple and that's because these are uniform fields. In the case where we have a point charge or gravitational force in a, in a um, between two point uh, objects. Now that is where the calculus becomes a little bit more annoying. It's not difficult by any means, but it's a little bit more annoying and it's a little less clear. So this is what I'm looking for you to understand. I'm gonna do one final graph on here and it's gonna have to be in black and over this stuff. So my point is I'm going to make a graph of potential versus location. And this axis will be potential. And over here, of course, it's electrical potential. And it's not relevant for me to do it sideways because the potential doesn't change as I go sideways in this field. I have to have a potential that's going, that's changing in the direction of the field. So over here, I'm going to say that this is location. This is location, this direction. And up this way, I'll be graphing potential. Let's see how that works. Gravitational potential, it says it's G times H. So it increases as I increase my height. So it's doing something like that. And the slope of this line? Well, I guess it's baby G. Ah. And the slope of this line indicates the strength of the force as well. So it indicates the strength of the field and it implies the strength of the force. Similarly, well, inside of this conductor, there's a little bit of a hint, inside of the conductor, the potential doesn't change at all. So I'm gonna get a graph that starts over here and it's just like And suddenly, when I get out here, there's no electric field, right? So we can't have a change in potential. So the potential is electric field times D and as I move that direction, the problem is I define D to be dis D distance moved against the field and here I am moving with the field so my potential is actually going to decrease. It'll go down, 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 down and let's say that I decide that it hits zero right there. That's an arbitrary decision but I guess it kind of makes sense. So here I say potential equals equals zero, and here I say potential equals, I don't know, V max, whatever the heck that is. I don't care. But the point is, the slope of this line is the electric field because we differentiate the potential to find the field. So that's the importance of the potential. It can tell you about the strength of the field. If the potential does something more interesting than simply a straight line, then you will not have a uniform field and that's the power of calculus. Bye bye.